Welcome to the third episode of our podcast's third season, Scary But True Campfire Stories, brought to you by Dudes Camping. Hosted and narrated by Matthew S. Newbold. Thanks for listening, and please, spread the word, tell your friends, tell your neighbor. Post it on Facebook, Twitter X, Instagram, Truth Social, TikTok, and any other social media outlet that will be censoring facts that it finds inconvenient. Our goal is to share true stories of strange, supernatural, ghostly, and unexplained as we gather around the virtual campfire. Or maybe you are sitting around a real campfire right now. Maybe you have a strange but true story you'd like to share. Email us at dudescampingstories at gmail.com with your own Bigfoot, UFO, ghost, conspiracy, or just unexplained supernatural story and we'll consider it for broadcast. Don't forget to visit us on YouTube and Facebook at Dudes Camping. UFO sightings have increased over the past few years, and they seem to be a common phenomenon among all walks of life. Everybody has their theories of what is actually going on, from space beings protecting the universe to interdimensional deceivers with nefarious intentions. Rarely do you find someone who has an encounter who doesn't try to interpret it in the language of their culture. The following story is as accurate as the memory of the person reliving it. But in this case, Kevin simply tells the events that unfolded before him. He doesn't try to interpret if he was specially chosen by these entities to spread world peace. He has only ever shared this encounter with a handful of his closest friends. Until now. Sit back, relax, and enjoy... The Lake Henshaw Lights. The year was 2001. I was playing keyboards in a Pink Floyd tribute band that sounded so much like Floyd that we were working all over California. I'd also started doing this thing called dueling pianos that was taken off for me, so I was busy all the time. I got a call late one afternoon from the bass player in one of my old bands. He said that he was finally getting married to the love of his life the woman he'd give up playing in bars for. Jenny, I asked. Jenny, who's... Oh, her... No, no, no. We broke up a year and a half ago. She was too controlling. No, this is Amanda. She's incredible. We met last week on a plane ride from Seattle. She's a flight attendant for Southwest, and we're getting married next month. Next month, I laughed. Why so soon? Because we are in love, dude. Love can't wait. Okay, whatever, I seceded. Do you need me to play piano at your wedding? Piano? No, man, we're having a small wedding, just a couple people, but I'm going to have a bachelor party to remember, one last get-together of musician shenanigans. That's why I'm calling. I want to invite you to the big send-off, man. Oh, cool, I said. When is it? Next week, he replied. We're going to do a couple days at a dry camp spot up in Hot Springs Mountain near Lake Henshaw. Lake Henshaw, near San Diego, I asked. That's the one. We're going to be at the top, past the RV campsites. It's kind of in the middle of nowhere, and I think it only has six fire rings. Hmm, I questioned myself whether this was a good idea. Out in the middle of nowhere... I was working quite a bit these days, and it wasn't easy to just cancel a gig. In this industry, reputation was everything. I looked at my schedule and saw that I was playing in San Diego that weekend. What days are you guys going to be up there? I asked. We're all meeting up there Friday night, and we're going hiking early Sunday before we leave. You don't have to stay the whole time, just as long as you make it, man. Everybody from the old band is going to be there. The whole crew. The whole crew. That would probably include Brian, the eccentric drummer that I introduced to the band before I moved on. We called him Brains because he seemed clueless about everything except drums. Man, he could play the drums. I really did miss all the guys. This might be the last time that I see them all together. I'll tell you what, I reasoned. I'm doing an early shift Saturday afternoon at the piano bar in San Diego. I should be done by 4.30. I could... Probably meet you guys up there by 5.30. Dude, that would be awesome. I could hear the excitement in his voice. I'll let everybody know that you'll be there. 
You want us to bring a tent for you, sleeping bag? I laughed. I don't know if I'll even sleep, man. I was picturing a jolly time of old friends sitting around the campfire, waving our steins and singing ditties deep into the night. I hung up the phone and began preparing my mind for what I expected to be a great reunion. I had a great shift at the piano bar and was in a good mood as I headed out to the campsite in my four-cylinder truck. I got to the foot of the mountain and pulled over to look at the directions I'd written on a half sheet of paper. They really didn't make any sense. I couldn't see any street signs, and some of these roads looked like hidden paths that led nowhere. I did not have a good feeling about this. I called the cell number of Craig, a sound guy that was brilliant at figuring out technical issues and would have no problem explaining these directions to me. The cell service here was awful, and I got no response. Darn it. I started driving slowly up the mountain while looking back at the directions in confusion. I was supposed to turn left at the third road, but I couldn't make out a road to save my life. I saw what looked like the third road, and so I turned into it. Just my luck. It ended up being a shoulder path with small rocks that looked like the beginnings of a road. Ugh. I put the truck in reverse to get back on the road when I felt the front chassis lift up into the air and the weight of the truck bed pull me backwards into a ditch on the other side of the road. I didn't realize how small the road actually was. I got out of the car and just stared at it. Shit. This was going to be a problem. My truck was now sitting sideways in a ditch on the side of this tiny road. There was no way I was getting that thing out without help. I called Craig's number again, but still nothing. What the heck am I going to do? I walked around holding my phone in the air, dialing and redialing, looking like a monkey trying to catch a digital banana. Finally, after 15 minutes, I got through, and I heard a drunk and high Craig answer his phone. Hello? Craig, dude, it's Kevin. These frickin' directions got my truck stuck in a ditch somewhere on the side of this mountain. I can't get the damn thing out. You're here? I heard him yell out to the group of what sounded like partying campers. Hey, guys, Kevin is here. No, Craig, I am not here. I am stuck on the side of the mountain. Oh, bummer. When do you think you'll be here, man? Craig was obviously high. That's why I'm calling, man. I was on my way to the party when somehow I drove my truck into a ditch and I can't get it out. I need somebody with a hitch to pull me out. You drove into a ditch, man? Why didn't you follow the directions? I wasn't even going to dignify that question with a response. Craig, does anybody have a vehicle that can get my truck unstuck so I can get there? Oh, yeah. One of the guys up here has a jeep. Great. Can he come down and get me out? Well, there's only one problem. What? I asked in frustration. The guy with the jeep is pretty wasted now. I don't know how helpful he'll be. He's staggering around the campfire looking for a place to pee. You gotta be kidding me. Can you take his keys and come get me yourself? If he's that drunk, he won't even know you're gone. All right, man. I'm probably the most sober one up here, but that's not saying much. I closed my cell phone and just sat by my car, waiting for Craig to make his way down the mountain. The longer I sat there, the more frustrated I got. This was supposed to be the good times had by all, as we sent our comrade off to the gallows of inevitability. But here I am, stuck in a ditch because somebody's poor directions, waiting for the only sober guy at the party I'm supposed to be at to pick me up in a drunk guy's jeep. I waited for what felt like an hour, but was really only twenty minutes until I saw the head beams of a jeep coming down the mountain. Dusk was creeping up eerily from the shadows of the trees that would soon hide this spot behind a wall of darkness and I needed to get to this party before I blew a gasket. Craig came lumbering over to where I was waving him down, driving like a man possessed with a teenage driver's license. What the heck is he doing, I thought, 
Has he ever driven a jeep before? Turns out he hadn't. And to make matters worse, it was a stick shift. It took us 15 minutes to figure out how to get the hitch attached to the truck. Neither one of us had done it before. Craig tried gassing it while I spun the wheels on my truck, but it just seemed to dig them deeper into the ground. Dirt was flying everywhere, and I saw our efforts as hopeless. It was getting dark, and neither of us knew what we were doing. Dude, I said, let's just come back tomorrow and try to get it out with someone who knows what they're doing. Craig agreed, and we left my little truck to the fate of the night. By the time we made it up the mountain to the campsite, the sun was beginning to set on the horizon. There were cans and bottles strewn about, as well as people broken off in groups. The sign that the party was winding down and that I had missed it all. Frustrated and late, I just wanted something to take the edge off. Give me a beer, I said as I stormed past the bachelor boy and stood by the embers of a fire that once burned enthusiastically. Now just the remnant of a good time had by all, except me. Everybody had been drinking and smoking all day. I could see them winding down, burnt out and glassy-eyed, and I had no desire to try and catch up. I felt like the odd man out. This sucks. Have a beer, man. I was pulled out of my temporary lull by a sasquatch of a man holding an open can of beer to my chest. I looked at the open can, which looked a third empty, then up at the man who had so graciously tasted it for me. No thanks, man. You can have the rest. Suit yourself. He cocked his head back and drained the can in one gulp. That's when I recognized him. Brains. He crushed the can and looked at me with a drunken, blank stare. Last time I had seen him, Brian was a tall, lanky drummer that could reach the farthest of cymbals. Before me stood an ogre with two hundred extra pounds and a beard that would make a lumberjack jealous. Brains, it's me, Kevin. Oh, Kevin. He hiccuped without any recognition in his voice. Kevin, Kevin, Kevin. You know, don't worry about it. I turned back to the dying embers. Hey, guys, I heard the bachelor boy announce to all fifteen or so people, eight of which were coherent enough to listen. The sun is almost about to go down. Who wants to go up to the precipice and watch it set one more time before we hit the sack? We have an early hike tomorrow. What? I just got here, and these guys are getting ready to go to bed as soon as the sun goes down? I can't leave because my truck is stuck halfway down the mountain, and I'm the only sober person without a tent. What did I get myself into? We walked up a winding path to a precipice which was only about 400 yards from the campsite. Bachelor Boy led the way as Craig, Brains, myself, and three others stumbled in the increasing darkness to watch the sun make its exit. Brains stopped to piss on a tree and I realized that nobody brought a flashlight to illuminate the path back down. We got to the top of a cliff face that overlooked an enormous California valley, a beautiful view as the sun was casting long shadows and unique orange and red hues over vast deep green hills. I could see several herd of cows in the distance, and across the valley were small campsites with fires just being lit. For a brief moment... I forgot about the unfortunate situation that I put myself in. They all toasted to an amazing moment as the sun slipped behind a mountain beyond the horizon, giving us just enough light to get back to camp. When all of a sudden, I felt a heavy thud near my feet. I looked down to see Brains lying face down on the rocky ground, one hand protecting his crotch and the other holding a beer that was slowly draining onto the dirt. Nobody else seemed surprised at his lifeless figure except me. I looked at Craig and he gave me a shrug. That's why I took his jeep instead of letting him drive. His jeep? I blurted out. You mean to tell me I gotta wait for brains to sober up before I can get out of here? The guy who just passed out on a cliff. The bachelor boy jostled him a bit, but this dude was not budging. 
How are we going to get him down to camp? I asked. I don't think we are, he said. Somebody's going to have to stay up here and make sure he doesn't roll off the cliff. Somebody sober enough. Oh, hell no, I interrupted him. I did not come all this way up here just to babysit some drunk drummer. They could see I was pretty pissed off. Craig tried to console me without luck. Man, Kevin, he's the only one with a jeep, and he's the only one who knows how to get your truck out of the ditch. Just keep an eye on him until he wakes up. It shouldn't be too long. Fine, I said, and everyone slowly started making their way back to camp. They would all be passed out in thirty minutes anyway, and I wasn't going anywhere. After we were alone, I lightly kicked Brains in the side. Brains! I bent down and yelled in his ear. Nothing. I painstakingly flipped him on his back and yelled louder. Brains! Nothing. I gave him a good swift kick in the side that should have got at least a grunt. Still nothing. This dude was out. I slumped down on the ground and leaned my back against a fallen tree. I just wanted this party to be over. I closed my eyes and started thinking about the band, some of the fun times we had, how lucky I was to play music for a living, things that would take my mind off the situation. I felt my anxiety begin to lift, and about a half hour went by. I looked up at the night sky to see the most amazing starscape you could imagine. There was practically no light pollution, and I could see the Milky Way lining the sky. That's pretty much the extent of my astronomy knowledge, though. I had no idea what I was looking at, but I knew it was quite breathtaking. Pretty soon, this magnificent palette of contrasting darkness and lights just became a curtain hanging over my head. I started looking for moving satellites until my neck began to cramp. I gave Brains another kick to no avail, then just sat there with my hands holding up my chin. I looked all the way across the valley where the other campsites are. I could see a couple motorbikes driving down the hill way off in the distance. There were three bikes just swirling down the mountainside. I envied whoever they were because they must have been having the time of their life, joyriding up and down the paths while I was stuck here babysitting Rip Van Winkle. I tried to listen to their engines, to distinguish between dirt bikes and motorcycles. They have distinct sounds. I strained my ears, but I couldn't hear a thing. It was dead quiet. I must have been too far away to hear the motors. I kept watching the beaming headlights of these bikes zooming in and out of paths and realized that they couldn't be headlights. They were way too large. I closed my eyes and rubbed my face. This night was messing with my head. At this distance, those headlights should be a lot smaller than that. These were large, glowing balls of light that were weaving and crisscrossing through the other campsites. It looked like they were racing around the canyon over there, but I should be able to hear something. Then I did hear something, but it wasn't the bikes. A jeep suddenly appeared near the campsite, and I could hear its distinct motor and see its twin high beams illuminating the short distance of road in front of it. The road, in fact was not a crisscrossing canyon or even that high up the mountain. I watched the jeep make its way toward the campsite at a pretty slow and steady pace. I looked at the motorbikes and noticed that they were much bigger than the jeep's headlights, and they were swirling around each other, much higher than the roads were capable of going. Plus, they emitted no sound whatsoever. What in the world? Suddenly, the hairs on my neck stood up, and I jumped to my feet. I was thinking that it was time to get down from the mountain. I looked at Brains on the ground and really started kicking him now. Wake up, damn it! Wake up and look at this! Nothing. I walked over to the cliff face and looked down. It was about a hundred feet drop, so I stepped back to give myself about four feet of distance from inadvertently stepping into the void. At this point, I had no idea what I was looking at. I was trying to rationalize it in my head, and so I just kept staring at it. It was just so weird. Suddenly, I was overcome by an unexplainable sensation. 
Something had risen up from below the cliff and was hanging somewhere to my right. I could see out of the corner of my eye some sort of glowing illumination. It was an orange light piercing the peripheral of my vision and I felt, not so much as heard a sound, but felt the vibration of the air around me like an electromagnetic thrumming. It wasn't like an idling engine or a helicopter. It was subsonic. It was off to my right about 50 feet and was hovering there a few feet from the cliff line. I tried to look at whatever this thing was, but I could not turn in its direction. At first, I thought there was something wrong with me. My head wasn't turning. My torso wasn't turning. I kept trying to force myself in its direction, but I could not turn my body. The harder I tried, the worse it got. I was immobilized by some weird force that was acting upon my will. This thing was hanging there, and it wouldn't let me look at it. I didn't know if it was a malevolent presence or just observing me. Was it going to do me harm? Am I being scoped or scanned? I just couldn't wrap my mind around it. I knew I wasn't completely paralyzed, because I was able to look the other direction at Brains. Brian, I hissed. If a kick wouldn't wake him, there was no chance a whisper would. I thought about picking him up and firemen carrying him down the mountain, but he was way too big for me to carry. I knew I couldn't just abandon him, so I stood as still as possible, hoping it wouldn't see me. After about five minutes, it dipped below the cliff line and I slowly turned my head with full autonomy now. What was that? I was so freaked out that I didn't even bother to run over to the edge and look down to see what it was. I started to run down the mountain, but stopped myself when I heard Brains groan and roll over on his side. It sounded like he might be coming too now, and I didn't want to take the chance of him rolling off the side of the cliff. Damn it. I ran back to Brian and just stood there trying to figure out what to do. He was still out, but I did not want to stay up here in case that thing came back. I slumped down and tried to wake him by rolling him on his back again. Gosh, he put on a lot of weight. When both shoulders were touching the ground, I stood up to give him another round of kicks. When I felt that orange glow off to my right again, I froze in place like a kid who'd been caught stealing. I tried even harder this time to turn in its direction, but I was still unable to move. It was almost distorting my vision so that I could not look at it. I could just catch the edge to know that it was spherical and it was orange. I could make out from my peripheral that it was a sphere inside a sphere, but I did not see a craft. The outer layer was an illumination that surrounded the more solid inner sphere, I did not notice any windows or doors. I couldn't get any more details due to the fact that I was unable to physically turn and look directly at it. It was somehow moving, even though there was no noticeable propulsion from blades or wings. That's all I could see. Was it because of fear that my body refused to let me look? Or was the thing itself keeping me from looking at it? Just glowing orange spheres of light... It moved very quickly and very silently. It was a very unsettling thing to see. This happened three times. The sphere would come up from below the cliff. It would stay there for about five minutes, then go back down. I became intensely apprehensive, as if whatever this thing was, it was testing me, observing me, playing with me, and at any minute, it was going to attack me. This is when things got really weird. I was rocking back and forth on the fallen tree I'd been leaning on all this time, wondering what the heck I was going to do. I was looking straight ahead, when suddenly there were three brilliant white spots right next to each other, and they seemed to be very low hanging. They were way too close to be stars. I was captivated with how intense and bright they were. All of a sudden... I heard a voice in my head say, Do not be afraid. We are watching them watch you. They are more afraid of you 
than you are of them. We? Them? This was too much. Now, when I say a voice in my head, that's the best way to describe it, but it wasn't a literal voice. More like knowledge or information that was downloaded, and I just knew what it meant. I got the genuine impression that they were quite physically frail compared to me or humans in general, like they were a consciousness in a relatively physical form, and that my human form was definitely a threat. Maybe that is why it was able to deflect my attention. I assumed the balls of bright light were there to give me a message, that they wouldn't let the orange ball hurt me, but at the same time, I could probably hold my own against it. How strange. The orange ball dipped below the cliff line and rose a few more times. Each time was the same thing. I couldn't turn to look at it, and it only appeared when I wasn't looking in that direction. At one point, I stared at the cliff for a good twenty minutes and figured that it had gone. As soon as I turned back to the balls of light, I felt the hum and the orange ball was back. This happened a few more times, and then I watched the three balls of light move farther away and eventually disappear. There was nothing to my right, and I could tell the sun was rising behind me. I looked down at Brains, and his eyes fluttered open. You gotta be kidding me. This dude was dead to the world, and as soon as the weirdness stops, he wakes up. I wonder if they were here to abduct him. But I happened to be interfering with some multi-galaxy probe operation. But how did I go from sunset to sunrise in such a short period of time? It didn't feel like twelve hours between sunrise and sunset. I felt pretty present the entire time, and I know that I didn't leave that spot. I'm not aware of any missing time. But what if there was a moment when I wasn't conscious and something took place that I can't remember? That's a terrifying thought. Now that it was light and Brains was awake, I ran down the mountain to tell somebody, anybody, what I had just experienced. They were all getting ready to go on their hike and a few people were heading home. I grabbed one of them and we went back up the mountain to get Brian. The whole way I was telling him exactly what I could remember and just how amazing it was. He was coming down from some drug-induced high and it probably sounded like any other campfire LSD trip to him but he listened with less than enthusiastic applause. Brains was sitting upright now, ready for his morning coffee, and I was ready to get the heck out of here. I didn't have a problem getting my truck unstuck once Brains was coherent enough to do the job, but the whole way down, I kept asking him if he remembered anything on the precipice. He remembered toasting to the sun, taking one giant swig of his beer, and then waking up to the sunrise with his ribs hurting real bad. I didn't have the heart to tell him that it was because I was kicking him all night. I think speculating on my experience is pointless. I can only report on what I experienced and saw. I saw a spherical orange glowing orb and three bright lights that spoke to me in an intelligent manner. I can't tell you what it really was, but that it was really weird. This encounter didn't turn me to religion or the new age to try and rationalize my experience. I believe the world is full of things that we don't understand, nor are we meant to understand them. We are meant to experience them and keep walking forward. It's almost like the mystery itself keeps us going. If we ever discover the truth behind the mystery, like finding out how a magic trick is done, we would probably just be disappointed. Thanks for listening to Scary But True Campfire Stories presented by Dudes Camping. Narrated by Matthew S. Newbold. Do you have a story that needs to be told? Email us at dudescampingstories at gmail.com with your scary but true story and we'll consider it for broadcast. Please, hit the like button and subscribe if you enjoyed this story and leave a comment. It really does help us out. Until next time, we will see you around the campfire.